Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I, uh, I thought we might want to tip our hand a little bit and preview our uh, next health series, even though this tech club is certainly not over with. But in the fall, we have another series that we're doing in conjunction with LMH Health, and it's called Gray Anatomy. And we will be examining one body part, if you will, or function of our aging bodies every month with a doctor or specialist from LMH South, starting with ears and hearing in September, and then uh, brain and memory in October. So we're really looking forward to that, having some fun putting that together. So just file that in your memory bank and uh, you'll get more information about that later. But now we have Taylor Buchanan uh, with us today. Thank you, Taylor, for joining us. Um, Taylor is the IT manager for LMH Health, and he is here to um, tell us all about our patient portal that, um, that we all have access to. There's some, a sign-up procedure I'm sure he'll tell you about, but I have one and I use it um, a lot. I, in fact, I find that it's um, I can get test results or, you know, scan results or whatever faster than uh, my doctor's nurse can call me back a lot of the times, but I don't know everything about it. And I'm certainly um, eager to hear the ins and outs. He's also going to discuss a little bit about telemedicine, which, as you know, since uh, COVID, um, COVID absolutely changed the way we um, are delivered our healthcare or the way we see our doctors in many cases. A lot of us have had telemed appointments, some of us haven't, but uh, a lot of us like it. So it'll be interesting to see if that continues. Uh, but Taylor's here to kind of fill us in on everything. And with that, Taylor, I'm just gonna put the program in your hands and I will shoot you some questions as they come up on the chat if, if I see an opening, okay? All right, very good. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. I'm going to start to share some slides here. Hopefully everybody can see those okay. Yep. All right, um, so my name is Taylor Buchanan. Um, I've been with uh, LMH Health for 19 years. Um, I have been in the IT department for about 11 of those um, and have spent uh, the majority of my time in IT um, working with the electronic medical record and I've been focused on um, the patient engagement side as well. So how patients can access their own information and uh, making that easier and more accessible. So I'm excited to talk to you today. This is a, should be fun. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, we'll talk about the enrollment process for Portal. Uh, we'll see how to sign in. And then I'll switch over to uh, the website and we'll actually walk through the website itself. Um, and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions as we go. We'll go kind of th slow through each of the sections um, and we can take questions um, on each one. So the first step uh, is an enrollment process, and there's two ways you can do that. Uh, the first way is to enroll in person. So when you have an in-person visit at LMH, um, as you're at the front desk um, getting registered, the front desk staff will ask you if you'd like to be enrolled. Um, and if you say you do, they'll ask you for an email address. address um, and then at the conclusion of your visit, uh, you'll get an email that looks a lot like uh, the one to the right here. Um, it's got the, a link in it next to that first bullet point where you can click. Um, that's gonna ask you for some demographic information and a username and password, um, and that'll get you uh, access to the website. The second way is online. Um, so if you've previously provided your email address to LMH, um, you can actually enroll yourself um, so if you go through a clinic visit or a hospital stay and um, you don't sign up um, during registration and you decide you want access um, once you've gone back home, you can come online to our website at lmh.org um, and click this white button up here in the upper right corner called My Patient Portal. Uh, and then there's going to be three buttons about halfway down the screen. And to enroll, you'll click the second one, which is sign up for an account. Um, so that's going to ask you for a couple of things. It'll ask you for the same demographic info just to make sure we've got the right account matched with the right person. Um, it'll ask you for that email address. Um, if you haven't provided an email address to LMH previously, you can uh, still enroll with your medical record number. Um, that's a identifier that we use to match up your records. Um, and that's available on your discharge paperwork. So if you leave an inpatient stay or if you um, complete a clinic visit, 
we'll offer you some paperwork at the end and uh, your number will be at the top of uh, at the top of that paperwork. It'll usually be designated with a little MRN label there. Um, so that number uh, is what you can use to uh, go through self-enrollment if you haven't previously provided your email address to LMH. Once you've enrolled and set your username and password, um, signing in is a lot like enrolling. So again, we'll go to lmh.org. We'll click that white button up there in the upper right corner. And then we'll click the sign into your account uh, button there about halfway down the page. Then you'll see a sign in page where you put your username and password. Um, if you have trouble remembering your password, there is a forgot password link there. Um, where you can go through and answer some questions uh, to reset it. Or there's also a 1-800 number um, that's listed under that forgot password section with some representatives that can help you uh, regain access if you do forget your password. So once you've uh, enrolled and signed in, um, you'll get access to the patient portal website. And I'm gonna stop sharing my slides here and we'll switch over to the website. So when you first signed in, you'll see a homepage that looks like this. Um, it's got uh, some key results. So a subset of your vital signs and uh, labs over to the right. Also lists your allergies um, on the homepage too here. Uh, there's four buttons along the top with some um, commonly used functions. Um, so if you, we'll get into this in more detail, but you can message your provider, schedule an appointment, uh, view your doctor's notes, or there's a help section here as well. There's also buttons over on the left-hand side. Um, this LMH health button just takes you back to our website at lmh.org. But the rest of these sections uh, start to get into the data that's in your medical record itself. In the health record section, the first one is really just a summary of um, information that's contained in other sections as well. So this gives you kind of a snapshot of things like your current medications, immunizations, allergies, and your problem list. Um, you can uh, request refill or renew of medications from here. Um, a lot of times the clinic's gonna wanna want you to contact your pharmacy for renewals, but there are uh, certain medications that you can request renewal uh, right from the website here as well. Um, if you have a question about uh, dosing information or uh, instructions for taking a med, those are included here um, as well if you drill into uh, the information for each medication. You can also click the link out to an education document that'll uh, it'll list um, set possible side effects or uh, interactions, um, things that your provider may want you to know about taking that particular medication. The clinical notes section, um, this one's kind of special to LMH. Um, we are uh, one of the few places in the region uh, that actually open up the full provider note to patients. Um, we've been doing this, I think since about 2016, um, and now it's becoming a regulatory requirement. Um, so more and more hospitals will start to do this, but um, LMH was kind of on the forefront of um, opening these notes up. So if a if I go through a uh, inpatient stay or a clinic visit, um, I can actually come out here and see exactly uh, what my provider put in as a note for that stay. Um, so I can click on the title here and it's gonna load the document itself. From here, I can print the note. Um, I can download it as a PDF if I need to send it to another, uh, to send it to a specialist or another provider, or if I just wanna copy for my records, I can uh, save that from this point. Medication section looks a lot like the uh, same section up in the medical record summary. Um, again, I can request refill or renew. I can also come out and view um, dosing information for my current medications as well. Vitals and labs. Um, so this is a subset of uh, vitals and lab results. Um, there are some things that we don't display on patient portal um, due to um, sensitivity, really. We, our providers um, 
have certain types of results that they really would want to talk about face to face or via phone uh, versus displaying them here on portal. But uh, probably 95% of the items in your chart will be displayed out here. And uh, to Kathy's point, there isn't a delay. Um, so as soon as the result comes back from the lab or from radiology, um, it'll be visible out here on your portal. So you can come out and take a look at it. Taylor, I think this is a good opportunity to just to squeeze in the first question. Gracie wants to know how long those notes, those clinical notes are available to people. Do they just stay up forever? Yep. Yeah, those notes, as soon as they're signed, those notes stay out here forever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So back in the uh, vitals lab section, um, I can see uh, my most recent labs here. I can also look at a trend of results. So if I have a, a particular value that I want to see over time, I can click on show more, uh, show more values and see a trend of that particular result if I've got multiple um, entries. And just like notes, there's no time frame on this. It's going to show me my entire history here. Radiology reports is a lot like notes. Um, so I can come out and view the report itself. Um, we can't view images yet, um, so I can't get the actual images themselves. Um, we're working on that. Um, if I need the images, uh, they can be requested through our HIMSS department. But if I just need the report um, to, again, send on to a specialist or just have the report for my records, I can come out and download the report itself. Uh, pathology and uh, microbiology are both the same. Um, my, my fake patient doesn't have any path or micro on them, um, but the report would look the same as the radiology uh, report in their section. A procedure history. Um, so this will show both procedures performed at LMH, um, as well as any that uh, I've reported to um, my nurse or uh, other staff um, during the history process for a clinic visit. So I can come out and make sure that my history is documented correctly, that all the dates are correct there, um, and uh, just kind of get a feel for what's overall in my chart um, from the procedures section. Okay, can you define procedures just for, for, for my benefit, if not everybody else's? I mean, because usually they say, have you had any surgeries? And you kind of rattle off the surgeries you've had. The procedure, I would think, would expand that quite a bit. Um, so the section itself will show you more than just surgeries. Um, it will show you um, things like colonoscopies or endoscopies, mm -hmm. um, outpatient procedures, essentially, uh, as, as well as anything performed inpatient. Um, so this isn't just surgeries, but surgeries are definitely included on here. Okay. The document section is a popular one because this is where your patient education lives. Um, so when we discharge you from a clinic or a hospital stay, a lot of times we'll give you um, a printout with um, different education documents. Um, sometimes they'll be, sometimes they'll have pictures, sometimes they'll have exercises, things like that. Um, and you can come out here and uh, refer back to these if you need to. Um, if you need another copy, um, you can always come out to the document section and open up your patient education from here. And it will show you um, any diagrams or um, images that are included will come here as well. The visit and record summary is also a pretty popular section. So um, as we've had more and more uh, sort of regulatory initiative to um, become more interoperable with between hospital systems, um, we've kind of needed a way to uh, be able to export your medical record in sort of a computer readable format, something um, that you can take from LMH and send to another provider and that other provider can just import right into their computer system rather than having to go through you know, hundreds of pages of documents. Um, and this is a section where you can actually download that computer readable file um, and send it to another provider if they request records. So under this uh, record summary section, 
the first link here is actually a way I can download my entire record. Um, so the record summary would be across my entire history of LMH, I can uh, generate this record, uh, get um, all my notes, all my labs, all my vital signs uh, across my entire history, download them all into one file and be able to send them on to someone else. Um, these other sections, are, it's the same type of um, sort of computer readable document, uh, but it only encompasses one particular visit. Um, so if there's a particular inpatient stay that I need to generate um, uh, documentation for to send to another provider, I can come out here and choose that particular visit date and uh, generate the summary just for that subset of my record. And if we look at one of these, the formatting is not the greatest. Um, it's got a lot of identifiers that the computer will understand, but we really won't. Um, so this is uh, this might be interesting to look at to see your entire record, but really this is more for what's behind it, uh, behind the scenes where there's a lot of uh, metadata and things that other uh, other hospitals would be able to use to import into their record. Now, when you say hospitals will be able to import into their records, does that require our permission as patient to do that? Or are you all just passing things around? It does require permission. Um, so there are, there are automated ways that we can exchange data between uh, organizations, but we don't do any of that without an explicit permission on behalf of the patient. Um, right now, I think the permission is a sort of a blanket statement that yes, you can send my record elsewhere. Um, but I think in the future, uh, there will be regulatory requirements where we have to get explicit permission to say, okay, we can send your record to KU Med, or we can send your record to Olathe Health versus you can just send my record. Um, are, are there uh, um, other, I'm thinking of if you're in an emergency situation and you're unconscious at another hospital and they send for your records and your power of attorney is on vacation or something like that, would they say, hey, in, in case of a true emergency, yeah, we'll, we'll release this or something? I mean, is there a, yeah. is there a common sense workaround? Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on the compliance side of things, but there are exceptions uh, for situations where someone's incapacitated and something's medically, it's deemed medically uh, necessary to send information or to communicate. Um, there are exceptions to those information sharing rules that apply to that. Okay, and while, while we've stopped, uh, forgive me, Taylor, but um, Audrey would like to know if a surgery from four years ago would be included in these records. They would be. So that history um, would encompass your entire chart. Mm -hmm. Your entire chart for as long as you've been under the care of anybody affiliated with LMH, LMH Health? Correct. So okay. any any information that LMH has on you will be included here. Um, if it's a, if it was something performed outside of LMH and it hasn't been gathered as part of a history um, taking for one of our visits, it won't necessarily be on here. Okay. And then uh, Carol wants to know if this um, software we're looking at was developed by Cerner. It was developed by Cerner. Um, so we are uh, we do use Cerner as our electronic medical record um, vendor. Um, they're located in Kansas City, so it's convenient for us to be able to, um, to collaborate with them uh, since they're geographically close. And um, we've, been, uh, we've been on Cerner since 2002. So um, yeah, we've been with, them, been with them quite a while. And many Lawrence folks work there, so that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, Gracie wants to know if we stop using LMH, say we move or something, can we still see our records? Yeah, so your <clears throat> access to your record doesn't expire. Um, if you request it, we can revoke it for whatever reason, but uh, by default, um, once you enroll, you have access uh, indefinitely. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, yeah, Kathleen wants to know about the security of the portal against hacking, et cetera. Yeah, so um, there are things in place during the enrollment process where we're matching um, the information you provide behind the scenes with your record. And if those things don't match up, uh, we don't necessarily tell you what doesn't match. We just tell you that we couldn't match you up. Um, so that's one of the ways that uh, we 
try to prevent people from sort of fishing for an account, um, just trying like names or addresses or things like that. Um, so there are some there are some security uh, features in place that do um, prevent uh, somebody from trying to enroll as somebody else. Um, the enrollment process uh, in person um, is controlled as well, since you do have to enroll face to face. Um, we do try to control it a little bit that way. And then once you get enrolled, um, once you're on here, everything is encrypted. Um, so your the connection between your computer and uh, the patient portal website um, is completely encrypted and safe. Okay, and there's no uh, worry about your insurance information or your Medicare number or your social security being on here. That that That's not what this is. I mean, there that's not there, right? Your billing so, information, things like that. So the billing, the actual billing aspects are separate. Um, so being able to pay your, like pay your LMH bill or um, access an invoice is a completely separate system than this. It actually uses a separate username and password too. Um, so those systems are kind of firewalled from each other. Okay. Taylor, the questions are flowing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ellen wants to, which is good. Ellen wants to know if signed up with a doctor for his portal before they joined LMH, will that info be transferred? And is the sign, is, is the sign on the same? So the information generally will be transferred. Um, when we bring on a clinic into LMH, we do sort of that historical copy from um, the original clinic into our record. Um, the sign-on will most likely be different. Um, we really, we really can't import um, those usernames and passwords. We'd really, we would um, probably do a mass communication to prompt folks to go ahead and go sign up again on our portal versus the original one. Okay. Um, now, Audrey, you might want to explain this uh, question if I, if I can't. Um, her, her daughter was born in 1962 at LMH. I, can she access her birth records from that long ago? So that's, that is an interesting question. Um, I yeah. know we've got, we've got a basement full of microfilm um, with those records from that far back. Um, and our HIMSS department will go through and digitize those if there's a request. Uh, so theoretically, um, if you make that request and we can find the microfilm, yes, you'd be able to, you'd be able to access. Okay. We're caught up. Carry on. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next section we'll look at is appointments. Um, so the first section here shows me any upcoming appointments I have with LMH. Um, so my patient has a, a family practice visit with Dr. Gravino. Um, this just lets me come out and reference my schedule. I can come out and add it to my calendar. If I'm accessing the, this uh, on my phone, I can add it to my phone calendar just like that. Um, I can also get directions. Um, so uh, Matt Oriad, for me, it's still recent, but Matt Oriad moved uh, relatively recently out west. Um, so I can click on the link here to get a reminder of their new address here. I can also access their phone number. Um, and if there's any instructions um, that were provided at the time of scheduling, I can come out and review those here as well. So um, Matto wants me to arrive 15 minutes prior to my appointment and I can reference that out here. One thing that's relatively new for us is online scheduling. Um, so we're still sort of in the process of rolling this out. Um, but we do have uh, a subset of appointment types that you can come out and schedule, kind of like booking a hotel room. Um, so for example, if I pick screening mammogram here as my visit type, we do screening mammograms out at uh, the West Campus now. So that's the location I can choose from. And it's going to show me the dates and times that are available. Um, I can uh, look for a particular date or look for particular days of the week. Um, once I find a time that works, I can pick it. It's going to ask me a few more questions about my appointment. But once I click schedule, um, that appointment's put directly into the schedule uh, with the uh, radiology department. And they'll contact me to ask some follow-up questions for a mammogram. But uh, really, that's it. There's no... Um, there's no other phone calls, there's no other scheduling processes. 
I've just come out here and, and booked myself. So um, we are working on expanding access to this. Um, right now, uh, what's available for self-scheduling is fairly limited, um, but I can still come out here and choose other from this drop-down list. And that gives me a, a more open-ended uh, form that I can fill out to request an appointment with um, a clinic that's not ready for completely to, to self-schedule yet. Um, so from here, once I choose other reason, I can uh, type the name of the clinic that I want to uh, have my appointment with. So if I type Mount Ori out here, if I have a preferred, preferred provider, I can enter it. Um, I can choose first available or choose my range of dates or a date here. If I've got a preferred time, I can choose that. Um, it's gonna ask me for uh, why, uh, why I need an appointment um, and how we follow up with you. Um, so you can request to be followed up with uh, by secure message and we'll get to the messaging part here in a second. Um, or you can request a phone call to follow up just to confirm the, confirm the date and time of the appointment. Uh, Shawnee would like to know if doctor's appointments and notes that are not at LMH still are still entered on the portal. Shelly, do you mean um, physically at LMH or with a non-affiliated doctor? I, I think that the doctor is probably affiliated, or at least the practice is affiliated, but their, their offices are definitely not on the campus. Um, but I know that they have some sort of a portal system, which I have not used. So I didn't know if it was the same portal, if they're using something different and I'm getting confused. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, patient portal for LMH health encompasses the entire health system. Um, so it's not just um, the locations that are on our campuses. Uh, it also um, encompasses Tonganoxie, Eudora, Baldwin, McLeod, all of our outliers um, and specialties as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's the entire LMH family. Okay. All right, next we'll talk about messaging. Um, so the messaging section here looks a lot like email, but um, there's a crucial difference in that it's encrypted. Um, so when you're sending a regular email through like a Gmail account, um, the odds are low that something would get spied on, but it's definitely possible. Um, so when you're communicating uh, confidential medical information, um, it's important that you uh, can come out here and communicate directly with your provider uh, via a secure encrypted method like this versus just sending a regular email over the internet. Um, so when a provider sends a message to you, you'll get a generic notification to your email address that you signed up with that just says you have a message on your portal. Um, it doesn't include any of the details that were in the message itself. It's just that notification that you've got something to look at out here. Um, so then once you sign into your inbox, um, you can come out here and view the message just like an email um, and reply or forward it on. Um, you can also initiate a message from here as well. So if you go to your inbox and go to send a message, I can type either a clinic name here or a provider. So I can type Dr. Gravino or I can type Mount Oriad and see all the providers that are at Mount Oriad. Um, I can type a subject just like a regular email. Um, I can also in include attachments. So if there's an image of an injury or a spreadsheet of blood pressures or something I need to send in to Dr. Gravino, um, I can attach a file here, um, just like an email. And then I can also uh, compose a message, again, just like a regular email. Um, these messages don't go directly to your provider. They go to your provider's nurse. Um, so they'll the nursing staff will um, generally gather more context for the provider, or if they can, if it's a simple question that the nurse, the nurse can reply to, they'll generally reply directly to them. Um, but uh, these do go to a kind of a shared pool where um, nursing staff can triage them a bit um, and then reply if necessary.
Uh, moving on down the list, uh, vitals and lab results. That's the that's another shortcut to the same vitals and lab section we looked at before. Um, we just know it's a popular option, so we try to make it um, easy to get to. And then personal information um, is uh, another fairly popular section as well. So this shows you um, the demographic information that we have on file for you um, here at LMH, and you can uh, make updates here. Um, so if you move and have a new street address, or if you change phone numbers or emails, um, if you change insurance, um, you can come out here and enter your plan information. Or if you have a change to your guarantor or emergency contacts, you can update the, um, these here as well. Um, this generates a message to, again, one of those um, shared pools where uh, an LMH staff member will take that uh, message and update your record. Um, so this doesn't directly change anything in our database, but it does um, generate a message uh, where you can access or where we can update. Um, so once you've made your changes, you can choose uh, where to send it to. So if you have a relationship with one of our clinics, you can type that. Or if you uh, are only seen for inpatient or outpatient uh, appointments, you can type LMH and send it to our patient accounts department. Um, where they can update uh, your demographic information as well. Taylor, I wonder if we could go back to the vitals and lab results for just a sure. minute, and mm -hmm. you could explain something I got kind of hung up on when I first started using the portal. It's the date range. Um, because, you know, there are those of us who, you know, we get our labs done every year and we want to check our blood sugar and kind of how, but, but you have to make sure to put the dates in correctly because see this this just pops up the default is like one week's worth in november so would you explain a little bit about how that works sure so the dates that are applied in here are the dates that a result actually comes into our system um, so that may not if it takes a while for a lab test to come back it may not directly correlate to the date of a visit um, or the date that an order got put in um, so you may need to come out and modify this date range a bit. I think by default, uh, this will try to narrow down to sort of your last subset of results um, and give you a little bit of a buffer, just so it's not loading your whole record when you first open up the page. Um, but this, you will probably need to tweak uh, this date range to see more history if you're looking for something more historical and less recent. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because if you want to check your your blood, blood sugar reading last week against last year against the year before, you'd have to expand that and find the blood sugar and then go back in time? Uh, so I think this link is relatively new, this view all for this result, um, but that would take care of that scenario where, oh. so I could find my most recent um, blood sugar reading and click this link. And then that's gonna pull just my entire history of readings onto the screen so I can view them as more of a trend. Great. Okay. Um, Audrey says hacking is a big problem these days. Do you have two factor identification or other security in place beyond the username and password? Uh, so we do uh, have a verification step via email. Um, I think two factor is coming from our vendor, Cerner, um, but I don't have a time frame. Um, but it is. Two-factor is relatively crucial these days, and um, I would love to have it as well on this site. So um, I know it's in the works. And so if you wanted to allow access from your spouse or child, you know, adult child, guardian, whatever, you would just simply, at this point, once you were enrolled and signed in or signed up, you would just give them your username and password to access it? So there's um, actually a different method for granting access to proxies. Okay. Um, so generally we, we ask folks to go to the uh, patient accounts department to get that set up. Um, and what they'll do is actually create separate portal accounts for both parties. Um, so you'll have access as the patient, um, but then your spouse, child will have their own account um, where they can essentially log in with their own username and password and proxy into your record. Um, that's become more and more of a topic as we 
um, get into more regulatory things with information blocking, um, where we need to start to now open up this uh, portal site to adolescents and their parents. And there's Kansas laws related to information sharing between adolescents and their parents. Um, so it's uh, it's certainly an interesting topic and, and one that's um, created some uh, interesting things uh, when it comes to displaying data out here. Um, yeah. But there there is a way to to be able to both um, proxy someone into your account from here, but also control what they see. Um, a lot of that's in the fairly early stages, just because the the um, the regulatory environment still sort of developing around it. Um, but uh, that that function does exist. Yeah, that's complicated, isn't it? Well, here's yes. a simple one. Can you can you adjust the size on the on this website? This the font size. You know, I don't know that you can through um, like settings on yeah. the website itself. Um, you can always in your browser, there's usually a zoom setting you can use um, to increase that. Sometimes it makes things look a little strange. And yeah, I don't think it's working on mine. I'm trying to click on your screen, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to click on that box up with the three red dot or the three colored dots, but I don't know yeah. what that is. It's not working. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I don't think there's a, I don't think I have a good, a good answer to that one, even though it is a fairly simple question. There's a plus sign um, up in the upper right. Is Could that be it? Or um, upper right corner of your screen? So this that? is actually, yeah, that's part of the browser. It actually opens a new, oh, okay. up a new tab there. Okay. Well, um, Gracie, browser, if, if, if he finds out differently that there is a way to adjust, we'll let you know. Okay, moving on. I guess we're caught up with questions again. Okay, um, that pretty much wraps up the portal side of things. Um, just as sort of a sneak preview, um, there are some things that aren't quite ready for prime time, like um, being able to fill out your intake forms from here before your visit. Um, mm -hmm. Those all, we're working on those and hopefully we'll have uh, that stuff rolled out this summer. So theoretically, the, the vision is that you'd be able to come out here, schedule your appointment yourself, and then fill out your intake forms and be ready to just immediately see the provider. Um, either via telemedicine or in person um, and completing everything through the website versus having to fill out a clipboard and sit in a waiting room. So that's kind of where we're headed with it. Sounds good. Save time. So I will switch back to my slides here and we'll talk a little bit about telemedicine really quick. I forgot, we do actually do have a phone app as well. Um, so the, the phone app looks a lot like uh, the website, but it is um, out there in the Apple or Android app stores. Um, if you search for LMH Health My Patient Portal, you can download the app and then sign in with your account um, and access it um, via an app versus having to sign into the website. It's a little more convenient that way. And the app does use um, like uh, fingerprint authentication or face authentication, depending on what your phone has. So it's got that level of security in there as well. Okay, so telemedicine. Uh, we've branded our telemedicine uh, efforts as LMH Health Telecare. Um, so when you hear us refer to telecare, that's kind of what we mean, uh, these online uh, virtual appointments. And when you schedule um, a telemedicine appointment with LMH Health, uh, we'll ask again for your email address if we don't already have it. Um, you will uh, get an email from LMH Health Telecare um, that looks similar to this. Uh, it'll have your patient information, the date and time of your appointment, and it'll also have this start visit button. Um, so when that, um, when that appointment date and time comes up, um, you can access your email and click this start visit button. And you can do this on your phone or on a computer. It'll take you to the telecare website where it'll um, confirm some information and walk you through actually logging in. Um, we are removing 
uh, this login step. Um, so you won't have to do this coming this summer, but right now you do need um, an email address and password specifically for um, telemedicine or telecare. Um, but again, that's gonna go away here in a little bit. So once you've uh, signed in, uh, we'll ask to confirm a phone number for you just in case there's an issue with the video call um, or if the internet drops out or something like that, the provider can call you uh, to finish up your visit over the phone. Uh, you can also invite guests. Um, so if you've got family members that uh, can't physically be with you, but you still want them to attend your virtual appointment, they can attend virtually as well. Um, and you can add up to four uh, and send them an email invite at this point. Uh, we'll prompt you for, uh, again, to your reason for visit um, and to acknowledge um, our privacy practices and to allow your provider to be your health summary. You can also attach a file here, a lot like um, back in portal messaging, you can attach a picture or um, a document, something like that that you want the provider to be able to access during the visit. Um, then you kind of go into a waiting room where um, I think you you see a, uh, a quick little video with a tutorial of what things will look like once the provider joins. Um, you also have an, have an opportunity to test your, uh, your webcam and your microphone just to make sure everybody's going to be able to hear and see each other um, before the provider actually hops into the visit. And then once the uh, provider hops on, you'll see them full screen um, and they will see you full screen um, and you'll be able to conduct your visit virtually um, and go from there. So um, that's really all I had for telemedicine. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I've used it a little bit, I, I love it. So it's one sort of silver lining of recent events is that um, it kind of lit a fire under us to get our telemedicine uh, expertise ramped up. So um, it is kind of nice to have, and we'll definitely um, stick around even as the, as the pandemic starts to fade here. So. Yeah. I, again, I've said this before. I think, I think this is a lot like, you know, when we've discovered the convenience of zoom that for a lot of people, um, telehealth will be preferred over schlepping, you know, to the doctor and in ice and snow and rain. And uh, so I'm glad to hear it's gonna stay around. Did it exist before um, COVID, Taylor? Uh, we had just started rolling it out right when COVID really ramped up. And then it went from, it's one of those things where it went from a six, six month rollout plan to about a two week rollout plan. Um, but uh, this, we used it quite a bit. Um, I don't, I don't remember what percentage of our appointments are telemedicine now, but it's a significant percentage. Um, even as we get back into a situation where we can have more face-to-face -face visits, obviously um, younger folks prefer it. Um, and really everybody prefers it just because it's so convenient. So, yeah. And when they ask you how much you weigh, you can just say, oh yeah, I just weighed myself and <laughs> I've lost 10 pounds. Not you know, really. the next, yeah, the, ne <laughs> the next part of this is connected scales and connected blood pressure. So no, <laughs> no, no, no more no. fudging at that point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Shelly wants to know how the visits are handled. Uh, Shelly, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, I, I was saying, actually, just as you were saying about the weight, I was wondering how they handle the vitals because obviously you have, you may have a wish to fudge on your weight and and how do they know what your blood pressure is or you know whatever so right now um <laughs> with the way things are you can I, I assume you can fudge whatever you need to fudge uh but yeah the next step is um and we've started to look at this at lmh is providing patients with connected uh biomedical devices like scales um like blood pressure cuffs where I'd have a blood pressure cuff that would connect to my phone and then we'd both be able to see the precise value come over the computer um, during my visit. Um, so no more, no more fudging my values. Um, yeah, and obviously, you know, obviously it's going to be counterproductive if you do, you know, um, so, and I guess it depends on what, what you're experiencing and what your ailment is and how serious it is. And, and I would guess they'd say, you need to get in if you need to get in, right? I think that's the key is that we've always 
we did have to implement some restrictions around visitors and things like that, but we absolutely were seeing, and we had to do some things with waiting rooms, like having folks wait in their car instead of coming into the clinic and waiting in there. But we were absolutely seeing folks in person and, and still are um, during this whole ordeal. So yeah, if, uh, if you absolutely need an in-person visit, um, there are ways to do that safely. Mm -hmm. I think if you feel sick enough, you're not going to fudge on anything, you know. Um, okay, any other questions? Um, Gracie? Yeah, what kind of wait time is there when you're actually on the telehealth waiting for the provider to come on? What's the average wait time? You know, I don't have an exact number, but um, I would assume it's roughly about the same as an in-person visit. Um, and speaking as an IT guy, not a, not a doctor, sometimes <laughs> I know that can be significant. Um, I, I don't have the numbers to know if they're uh, better or worse. I would assume it's about the same. I, I think I noticed where you could get texted. Yeah, there was a, there was a step where you can... Um, See if I can get back. They would to that text slide. you, so that makes me think there's probably a significant wait time. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't expect anything longer than what you'd have in person. But um, you can, it does, you can um, sort of leave the waiting room, go back, and get a notification on your phone for when the provider is actually ready to see you. I've done it twice, just for the record, and my wait was no longer than five minutes. It was wonderful. Um, but that was during COVID when I'm sure patient loads were down and um, you just, you know, you don't have a lot of people coming in sick um, ahead of you. So, no, I think that's great. Could, would you um, like to unshare your screen, sure. Taylor, maybe if we're done, I mean, so everybody can, Anybody else now? I anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask in person and not through the chat? Um, let's see. Uh, a couple of mentions of security were were mentioned, but but nothing about. I think that the worry is that um, a hacker might try and use ransomware on the on the hospital or something, what kind of issues, I mean, what kind of um, security measures do you have against that kind of expert hacking? Yeah, we've, um, we've taken some pretty significant steps, um, especially here recently with the uh, increase in ransomware attacks. Um, you know, you've, there was, you know, three more in the news this week. Um, we've really restricted the amount of access that LMH employees have to the outside internet from LMH systems. Um, that hasn't been particularly popular, but uh, for example, um, you can't access arbitrary you know, social networking websites like Facebook or like Instagram or Twitter or whatever. You also can't access your personal email anymore um, because that is a big vector of the way folks get into systems to perform hacks is sending something to somebody's personal email account that they access on an organizational machine. And now that hacker has access to the network. Um, so we've really locked down uh, what our associates can access um, in order to be proactive, as proactive as we can to keep our system safe. Does, does that also pertain to outside doctor's offices? Cause I'm thinking nurses or you know, receptionists or something like that might not take, be as careful, shall we say, as actual hospital staff. Yep, so that applies. So the way our systems are set up, um, the outlying locations like Eudora, Baldwin, McLeod, all of their stuff goes back to Lawrence and goes through LMH and is controlled by LMH's security and everything else. So all of our out, uh, outlying locations are subject to the same security restrictions as the, the campuses. So if you are a, an employee of the, the system at large, you are not able to check your email or get on Facebook or something while using a work machine just on your phone. Have to do it, you have to do it from your phone and it, the phone can't be on an LMH network. Okay. Um, Ellen wants to know who decides when telemed is appropriate. She said, I made an appointment recently 
and wasn't offered it, but I probably would have chosen it. Does that kind I of think depend on the doc? Yeah, maybe? it's at the discretion of the provider. <laughs> um, a lot like patients, provi uh, providers, some providers are very comfortable with it and some aren't as comfortable with all the technology. Um, so some providers may be more, more willing to offer it than others. Um, it is kind of up to provider discretion. Yeah, we have to keep in mind that all our providers have varying degrees of experience and, and ability, just like we do. Some are older, some are younger, and it, you know they're just like all of us. Anybody else? A question? Jean, I see you maybe want to go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, I'm very uncomfortable on the computer and, and dealing with business stuff on the computer. And my guess is that a virtual visit would be much shorter because you just want to get off the computer. You know, you just, it's stressful. Well, that's why we're doing Tech Club. And certainly I think that's, you know, just a matter of, um, I, I don't know, Taylor, what do you, you try it once and then if it's too uncomfortable, you go in person maybe, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we, I know we see um, sort of more uptake with younger folks that are used to doing everything online, but um, for uh, populations that aren't, um, yeah, there's always there's always in person visits. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely for somebody like me that can mm -hmm. you know, hop on and do a video visit, and I, I love it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be in a doctor's office, so it's great to be able to do it from home. But uh, I can understand. <laughs> I, I was I was going to say it's I'm the same way. I have white coat anxiety big time when I'm in the office, but when I'm on my computer, <laughs> I'm pretty relaxed. So, to each his own, I guess, Gene. Um, but yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my blood pressure is always sky high when I walk in there. Okay, anybody else have a question before we call it a night? Um, yes, um, I lost you on the big screen, but I have you on my phone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I had a question. So um, if you sign up for this portal, they won't send you messages and things uh, through that. Solicitations, like, you mean, or unwanted? Yeah, no, LMH, like, I mean, the doctor's offices, like confirmation or anything through that, if you send, if you sign up, I mean, because I don't want to receive mess messages because I don't look at my email that much, but I want to get my uh, results, my lab results and different things. So yeah. do, are the message, do the messages live on the portal, on her patient portal page, or would they be duplicated through emails? So they would live purely on the patient portal page, but um, we don't necessarily, we don't send um, appointment reminders through this. We would send appointment reminders either via a phone call or a text or an, an actual email. Um, so the things that um, aren't really directly related to personal health information, uh, like correspondence with your doctor, we do try to keep at a portal just because we know it's an extra step to have to log into access. And at least at my doctors, we have the option. I, I let them know that I do prefer my reminders via text, but you can choose phone as well. You can, if you have a landline, you can choose that number, but, um, yeah. but they don't do I'll it through the portal. Honestly, also since we're older too, or some people have a lot of problems with blood pressure, you know, or just checking if you have fluid on your legs and stuff. So you're not able to do a lot of that stuff on, you know, through the on, online visits, yeah. televisit. Yeah, since it won't work for a lot of conditions, I would imagine. Okay. Anybody um, else? Yeah, if if uh, if the messages just live on the portal, but you don't sign on to the portal, means you never get your messages. Does does your doctor know that you haven't received the message that he may have sent or something? I mean, is there any is there any feedback that way? Because at least one time I had 
the doctor mentioned that I wasn't following instructions and going, what instructions? And I, you know, I had no clue what he was talking about. Yeah. So when a provider sends you a message via portal, um, if you don't open that message within three days, they'll get a note back saying so-and-so hasn't opened this message, please follow up. And I think they'll generally give you a phone call at that point. Okay. Anybody else? Well, let's all um, unmute ourselves and give Taylor a huge round of applause. Taylor, you did so well and you sounded so good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. It was, it was, it's great information, very helpful. And um, I think it'll make our lives a lot easier once we practice because that's, and, mm -hmm. and like we say, I, I'll ask you this just to verify, but we, we pretty much say this at the end of every tech club meeting. It you can't screw things up just to explore, right? Like people right. can go into their portal and click on anything they want and they're not going to mess it up. You're not gonna wipe out your medical record. No, nope. you're okay. Good, okay. So I encourage people to do that. Okay. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. You.